Your 
this morning, old folks. We're getting with it. All right, if you'll take your Bibles and open up to the book of Acts, this, uh, we're going to take a couple week break after this week from the book of Acts. And with Christmas and the new year coming up, we're going to have a couple messages for that. But we've been walking through the book of Acts. So if you'll turn over to Acts chapter 5 with me, we're going to begin in about verse 24. And uh, last week we talked about that the apostles had been arrested and put in prison. Some angels from the Lord came and let them out without anybody knowing but themselves. And they immediately went back to where they were, preaching and teaching in the temple. Uh, the guards went to the prison and looked, and guess what? They found the guard, or they sent some people to look at the prison, and the guards were still there, everything was still in place, but the apostles were gone. And so they had uh, some explaining to do, and they're trying to figure out, the religious leaders, as we'll see this morning, are looking, trying to figure out what happened. How did this happen? And we know it happened because a great miracle of the Lord took place with the angels releasing the apostles out of the prison. So, chapter 5, starting verse 24, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer before we get started. Lord, as we open your word this morning, speak to us, allow your Holy Spirit to roam and convict us and guide us and lead us in the direction that you need us to go if there's a direction needed. God, help us to be obedient to your word, never turning from the right or the left, but walking that straight and narrow path. God, we thank you for your word this morning. Speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So verse 24, and it says this. Now when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. Imagine, what now? These guys have miraculously got out of prison, and now where'd they go? They went right back to the temple and are going to start preaching again. And so these religious leaders who are trying to squash this movement out this new way, this followers of Jesus, they're thinking, what now? Verse 25. So one came and told them, saying, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Now, do you remember what they had just been told by this religious group? They were strictly told, do not teach or preach in this name anymore, in the name of Jesus. And as soon as they got out of prison... Remember, the angel of the Lord had given them a message and said, go back to the temple and continue preaching and teaching. And that's exactly what they did. And so these religious leaders are told, these guys went right back and are doing what you told them not to do. 26, the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. Now remember, not long ago, we read that they... Uh, healed the lame man, and a lot of people came to Jesus after they seen the lame man come to the Lord. Now, a lot of folks knew that they'd been put in jail, and now they're back at the temple preaching, even though these religious elites had told them, don't do it anymore in the name of Jesus. So they, when they arrested them again, they kind of had to do it in a, in a low-key manner because there had been lots of people who had come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Remember there in Rome? The Romans don't like uprisings. Whenever there was an uprising during this time, they'd bring in folks, the Roman guard, and they would squash it down quickly. So the religious leaders don't want to get a big uprising happening, and there's been quite a few followers who are coming to uh, Jesus as Lord and Savior. So they did it in a calm manner. Verse 25. So... Well, I'm, I'm 26 is what I just read. Let's go to 27. For they did, it says, they brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And then verse 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them. So again, the meeting of the minds, we talked about this, had already kind of taken place before. Here they are back, and it's meeting of the minds again. They brought them in, set them before the council. And guess what they said? Verse 28 saying, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Notice that the man is capitalized. They're talking about Jesus. So they're saying, 
Look, you did exactly what we told you not to do. We told you not to teach in the name of Jesus anymore. And you continue and you continue and look what's happening now. You're filling Jerusalem with your doctrine. doctrine. What is their doctrine? The gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And look what they said at the end. And intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Because why? Because you're teaching that we, they're teaching that the Jews, the religious leaders and the Jews, were guilty of putting Jesus upon the cross. So you intend to bring his murder upon us. Well, guess what? Their murder was upon them because they were the exact ones who insisted that the Romans crucified Jesus. So, in fact, their blood, Jesus' blood, was already upon them. But we also need to remember, why did Jesus go to the cross? Because of our sin. So before we point, yeah, the blood's upon them. Jesus' blood is upon us, too, as far as the reason Jesus went to the cross is because of our sin. And we need the blood of Jesus upon us, don't we? Because his shedding of his blood is what covers our sins. So in one sense, it's a bad thing to have the blood of God upon your hands and that you sent him to the cross. But on the other hand, it's a good thing to have the blood of Christ upon you because... That's what God sees upon us that covers our sin, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Well, it depends on what perspective you're looking at it with. Verse 29. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. Remember, he's kind of said that before. We have a choice to make. Peter had a choice to make. The apostles had a choice to make. You and I have a choice to make. Are we going to obey God or are we going to obey man? Each day we have the choice to live our lives for Jesus, to live out the word in our lives in the way that he instructed to live our lives, or we can choose to live it the way we want personally, or we can listen to somebody else tell us the way to live our lives. But as followers of Jesus, we were bought with a price, the Bible says, if we choose to follow him as Lord and Savior of our life, he bought, up with, bought us with a price, and we are to follow God. The Bible says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. You will obey the word of God. So he's telling them here, we're going to obey man. You can tell us whatever you want to tell us. You can tell us to stop whatever you want, but we're going to do what God has told us to do. And Jesus told them, go and share the gospel. Love others. Bring people to me, is what Jesus said. we got to ask ourselves each and every day, are we going to obey God, or are we going to obey what we want to do? Because a lot of times what we want to do may contradict what God's Word says. We have to live by the Word of God as followers of Jesus Christ. Verse 30, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered, by hanging on a tree. Boy, he goes right to the point. Remember they said, you want to bring this man's blood upon us. Well, he, he tells them here, this man's blood is upon you. The God of our fathers is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The, the Jewish faith, Israel. He said, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, talking about the resurrection. Remember, every time Peter teaches and preaches, he brings up the resurrection. Because, again, without the resurrection of Jesus, our faith is dead. He's alive and well, sitting at the right hand of God right now. He defeated death and sin. And that is a necessity for our faith. Without the resurrection, we don't have a faith. Because Jesus would be dead and in the ground just like any other religious leader who has rose up and said that their way is the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. So he points out, you murder him. He is, the blood is on your hands. Verse 31. Him, God has exalted to his right hand. The right hand in the scriptures usually means power. So he's telling them, him, Jesus, God has exalted to his right hand, to the, to the power to be prince and savior. And to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. 
That's why Jesus came. That's why as you go through the story of the Bible and Israel is woven in as God's chosen people and it goes to King David and you go through the genealogy and it goes all the way to who? Jesus. From their forefathers, who he talks about there, all the way to Jesus. He's the Prince of Peace, the Savior of the world, and he came to give repentance to Israel, and then Israel was to pass that along through the spreading of the gospel to the Gentiles so that the whole world can have forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. you got to repent of your sins, though. Don't miss that part. It's easy to say, oh, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. Well, it takes more than simple belief. You have to put your faith in Jesus, believe that he was born of a virgin, died on that cross for your sins, was buried and resurrected, and then you follow him for the rest of your life. Repent of your sins means turn away and walk in a new direction. You can't continue to live, say, I'm a follower of Jesus, and continue to live in sin. God says we've got to repent of it, turn from it, walk away from it. It doesn't mean you're not going to fall from time to time, but you're striving to live in perfection like your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes, you're going to fail. We all fail. But your striving in life is to follow Jesus as closely and become more like him each and every day. Verse 32. And we are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. They're saying we, the apostles, are witnesses. We've seen Jesus. We live with Jesus. He taught us. We've seen him crucified, and we've seen him alive. We are witnesses to the things of God, and they witnessed his teachings. And now he's gone back to the Father, and he sent us the Holy Spirit. Who does the Spirit come to? Those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. And those who, look what it says, obey him. Obey him. Obey God. Verse 33. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. The religious leaders did not like being pointed out and saying that they were wrong. And then they told them not to preach or teach in the name of Jesus. And now they're disobeying and then turn it around and point it back on them. And they were furious and they wanted to plot. They were plotting to kill those apostles. Let's just squash this out. Let's get rid of these guys. Let's kill them. They'd have had more blood on their hands. What? Says, then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. Gamaliel, somebody with a little common sense, as we'll see. And one thing to remember about Gamaliel, if I... If you want to look, you can flip over to 22, Acts 22 and verse 3. Listen to this. This is something just to remember about him. This is Paul talking here. I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Sicily, Cilicia, bought, brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law and was zealous toward God as you are all today. Paul was taught by this Gamaliel, and he was a very strict Pharisee Jew. And so Paul, in his early days, I suppose, when he was the strict Jew, was taught by this man. And so now this man, before he had started teaching, well, he may be in the process. I'm not sure exactly how the timeline falls out, but in this time frame, he'll be teaching Paul if he hadn't already done so at, at this time. And now he's standing up saying, guys, listen. And he was very respected, it says. And he could put, said, get these apostles out here. I need to talk to you guys. He's talking to the religious leaders here. Verse 35, and he said to them, men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these, these men. He's saying, think about what you're talking about doing here. These guys are following this man who claims to be God. And because of that, now you want to kill them? Think about what you're doing here. He said in verse 36, For some time ago, Thetis rose up claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. So he said this, Thetis, 
claimed to be somebody. He had a following of about 400 men, but guess what? After time, it just faded away. He became, nobody even remembers him anymore. Verse 37, after this, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. So I'm saying this, Judas of Galilee, he also had a following. He also had some teaching. Many some people followed him, but guess what? After time, he just faded away and came to nothing. Verse 38, now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or work, or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. So he's saying, these apostles whom you guys are, are wanting to kill, just leave them alone. Let them go out and do what they want to do. Talk about what they want to talk about. Because if this work is of their making and it's not real, it's just going to fade away after time. It'll come to be to nothing. So just let them alone. But look what the warning he says in verse 39. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it. Least you even be found to fight against God. He's saying this, if this is of God, you better leave it alone. Because if this is really of God, you are fighting against God. And it's going to come back on you. Well, we can look back over 2,000 years now. We know it was of God. It's still alive and well today. And this message has been tried to be squashed out. The gospel has been tried to be removed. Jesus has been tried to be removed from this world over and over and over again by many different men over the years. But guess what? It's of God, and it's still alive and well, and you will never squash out the name of Jesus because he is the Savior of the world. He is God, and he did come and do what he said he was going to do. And he's still alive, going to come back one day soon and take those who put their faith in Jesus Christ back to heaven with him. Praise the Lord. Verse 40, and they agreed with him, and when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Now, wait a minute. They called them back in. This guy said, just let them go and do what they want to do. But they didn't just do that, did they? They called them back in and beat them. Now, when you're innocent, are you supposed to get a beating? No. But they beat them as a little reminder not to continue to do what they're doing and commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they did somewhat listen to Gam Gamaliel here, but in another sense they didn't because they still wanted to give them a little reminder, quit doing what you're doing. Now look at the apostles' reaction. Verse 41. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Hmm. Wonder what we would do. Somebody come to our house today and jerked us out and said, I heard you've been talking about Jesus. We don't want you doing that. And they beat us up, said, Don't do it anymore. When they left, would we rejoice that we were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus? Or what would we do? Seek out a little revenge? Call the police? What would we do? That's not what the early church did. They rejoiced that they were worthy of suffering for Jesus. Try to think about that in your own life, about us trying to spread the gospel and tell others about Jesus. What's, you know, we've said it time and time again, at this point, it may change over time, but at this point, most time people may just laugh at you, shut the door in your face, tell you to get away from them if they don't want to hear it, tell you're a looney tune or something of that nature. That's about the worst we're going to face at this point. Now it may change. We may get something more serious down the line if things don't change. Would we count it as an honor to suffer for Jesus? Verse 42. And daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Remember, they were just told again and got a little beaten for it. 
Do not teach or preach about Jesus anymore. And here's a little reminder. Don't do it anymore. So they got beat. Well, guess what they did? And it don't just say every once in a while they'd sneak into the temple and go to houses. It says daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Daily. Folks, that's our job as well. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we're daily to be telling people about Jesus and for people to see Jesus oozing out of our lives by loving people, helping those that are in need, inviting them to church, and telling them about Jesus, our Lord and Savior. So let us think about ourselves this morning. What will stop you from proclaiming Jesus? What will stop you? Yourself? Your neighbor telling you they don't want to hear it anymore? What will stop you? Might be one of these days the government may actually tell us we can't do it anymore. Is that going to stop you? They try to squelch it down now, don't they, in different ways, taking prayer out of schools and make sure you're not teaching your Bible as anything but history in school and things of that nature. Matter of fact, a lot of schools don't want your Bible in school at all or your prayer. Who do you obey? God, yourself, man, who do we obey? We need to ask ourselves that quite often. And do we rejoice? No matter what, we are able to serve God, and we need to do so. And it's a blessing to be able to serve God. Think about what he's done for you. He went to that cross for you. It's a blessing to serve God. And do we rejoice over that? Ability to serve God. Let's pray. God, you spoke to us through your message this morning. Again, it's pretty clear, Lord. The early church gives us an example of how you expect us to live for you. Totally sold out for you because you totally sold out for us. God, help us to tell others about Jesus. Help others to see Jesus living through our lives. But they want what we don't want. And that's you. Thank you for forgiving us of our sins, Lord, through your death on the cross. Lord, if there's one here who needs salvation today, may today be that day. Lord, for those of us who are already saved, let us recommit to you, Lord, that we're going to do our best. Speak of you, to tell about you, to love others on your behalf, and to live our lives as your Bible teaches us, as your word teaches us. We love you, Lord. Thank you. And we give you all praise, honor, and glory this morning. Amen. Would you stand?